Welcome to the Gold Derby's Meet the Experts panel for film documentaries. I'm Charlie Bright, and I'm joined by Megan Milan, the director of the documentary Simple as Water, which is currently streaming on HBO Max. Uh, first question I wanted to ask, Megan, uh, what aspects were you looking for when determining uh, which families to document for this film? Sure. Um, thanks for having me. Thanks for the question. You know, so the film is told in five distinct vignettes, um, each one uh, uh, focusing on a family in a different country. And um, the choice to do that was to try and find a way to convey the scale of the mass migration and displacement of uh, that the Syrian war had, had um, reaped. To, to honor the scale of it, but do so in a way that let me do what I do somewhat organ feels organic to me, which is very intimate observational. And so I wanted to find a way for the film to be both um, large and, and, and intimate at the same time and get in all of the different layers of experience or as many as we could um, of what the experience of displacement and, and war is. And so it felt like one family's experience of that would be anemic to the scale of the situation. And so I, once I sort of landed on that structure, I did a deep dive pre-production research and then the team started expanding beyond me. And there were hundreds of conversations, of course, first with Syrians who had been through it um, firsthand, um, but also with freelance journalists and trauma experts and refugee field workers trying to come through like what were the common ex family common lines of the family experience of war and one of those elements for example that you see in the film is um, children taking on ad adult responsibilities and so we have a couple of different chapters where you know big brothers are really serving as parents another element is that fathers often go ahead when families flee war um, to make sure the passage is safe and to figure out a route. And then families get stuck in, you know, Kafkaesque gas bureaucracies. Um, you know, there are gender norms that flip. Children end up out of school for years at a time because they're in sort of an interim country waiting. And so it was, you know, sort of collecting all of those sort of topical thematic through lines and then doing the work. And since we shot in five different countries, but we actually searched for families in eight um, of trying to identify families who were experiencing that um, would be going through it at a moment that we could get access to them. But then most importantly, that wanted to collaborate with us on the film and had that sort of film magic to them, had that dynamism. Um, I try and you know show a lot on people's faces and just in their interactions. And so I, I worked really extensively. We had um, two Syrian co-producers who worked across storylines, but then each country had sort of a mini family team. Um, often uh, our, both our Syrian co-producers, one of whom is a refugee himself, but, but a lot of the um, production assistants and researchers um, were as well. And uh, they would work with freelance journalists to go out scouting for families. So it was um, it was as intricate a, a process as that answer was to you. So, um, but it was, you know, it's that mix, right? People have to be in the right moment, the right time, sort of going through the right things. And then they just have to have that right dynamism. And in my case, because of that, Trust is so, so important as it is to most documentary filmmakers. Um, they have to want to collaborate. Uh, so um, uh, you mentioned that you were filming in several other countries, but there is one uh, vignette that does actually take place inside Syria. And I, was, and I wanted to know what sort of steps had to be taken to successfully film the segment about the family that's still living there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we um, filmed that chapter with two Syrian women who are who are still living inside Syria, who are credited in the film under a pseudonym. And um, it was the first time that I have not been present. I'm a very like I like to say like you know feet in the living room uh, filmmaker. So my relationships with the people I'm focusing on is is really important. But you know this was a war zone, a, con a country under war. It would have been dangerous personally to our crew, but most importantly, we're focusing on a family whose child has been forcibly disappeared. And it would have been very dangerous for any family we focused on to have foreign crew coming in. And so pretty early on, we decided that that wasn't something I was going to go do. And, and yet, you know, half of the country was forced to flee, but half of the country stayed behind. 
And I felt like that was an important element to include. Um, I also, the, that storyline focuses on a child who has been disappeared and, uh, and parents not knowing whether or not he is still alive, um, whether there's anything they can do to find him. And I felt like that not knowing um, for a film that was looking at the you know, experience of parenthood during war was a really fundamental one to include. And so we were able to find two women who worked with us. They wore a lot of different hats, producing camera sound. Um, and they went out and started talking to his families. And one of the things that, that drew us to Dia and her family was that they had already been public about their son Mohammed's disappearance. They also, it was, um, suspected very likely that he had been taken by ISIS. And so it was less of a risk for them to take. Um, so, you know, one thing was them agreeing to participate. Another thing was us agreeing that we were willing to have them take that risk. Um, but it was a film, you know, so dependent on people's faces that it wasn't something that we could um, make them anonymous. And so then I just did loads and loads of Skype calls and WhatsApp. And I went to Beirut and workshop footage with them and they would manage to get themselves um, from, from uh, Damascus to Masayaf where we filmed and, and we would manage to get the footage out and not to go into too much detail because we want them to be able to do it again if they need to be. But it was, you know, it was, it was challenging. There was times at risk, but we always were led, you know, by the safety of the family we were focusing on and our team first, um, but felt like it was really fundamental. Um, and that was a place where it was so important to have so many Syrians working intimately on the film who could always, you know, help us balance. Um, you you want to get the right things on the screen, but you want to get to them in the right way. And at the end of the day, you know, we're human beings first and filmmakers second. So, uh, so of the countries you documented, as, uh, other than Syria itself, uh, Greece, Turkey, Germany, and the U.S., uh, which one uh, did you find to be uh, most hospitable towards these displaced families? Hmm. That might be a low bar to clear, but... Um. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's such a, the, you know, and I don't speak from firsthand experience. This is the second film that I've made about the refugee experience. I made a film a couple of decades ago called Lost Boys of Sudan and, and then got to know a really large diaspora of the Southern Sudanese community. And I, I feel like the experience as an outsider, the experience of displacement is such a layered one and it's it's not linear either. It, it, it goes on and on and on. And so, I mean, I think there were elements, for example, where there were people in Greece really reaching out, a lot of volunteers showing up, trying to make things joyful. But, you know, Greece was so economically depressed that the opportunities um, to be able to find housing or enroll children in school or get jobs was so limited. And then, of course, there was a big backlash there, too. So, I mean, it's I'm hard put to find one to brag about, to be honest. But I guess one of the things that was really important and we were really grateful that it did keep coming up naturally in the days that we were filming with our subjects is, you know, it's a lot of individuals um, showing up who aren't tasked necessarily. It's not their job, just people giving of themselves and the people who are officially refugee workers, just like that, that personal connection. I think I can, you know, think of examples in every single story where that made a really critical difference. Um, and particularly in, in our U.S. chapter, um, you see that with both a pro bono lawyer and a public school teacher you know, who just one of, you know, just extended themselves, but, but that, but there were those folks in each, in each story. So I can't really, I can't brag on one of the countries. I think there were big, big challenges and points of light in each one. Um, and my final question, um, I was curious as to, you brought up uh, the, uh, uh, the young man uh, in the U.S. Uh, with his brother. Um, what is, what has uh, happened to them since the filming concluded? Sure. Yeah. So Omar is the big brother and Abid um, is his younger brother who was a teen uh, at the time. So um, Omar uh, is still waiting on asylum. Um, he's here legally, but he, um, he's sort of caught in the backlog of our whole delayed immigration system. So he's still waiting for his asylum. But Abid, um, who you see in high school during the film, has graduated high school and was granted asylum. 
Um, and then wonderfully, Omar um, has married a Syrian woman who came here as a refugee with her extended family. So they moved to Houston um, and are, are, are living there and have two baby girls, um, which um, he was already exhibiting his being a great father to his little brother. And now he is to, to two little girls. And one of the great things sort of piggybacking on talking about, you know, people extending themselves is he was almost done with his um, undergraduate degree in Syria when he had to flee in computer science and kept trying to get through human resources, online applications here in the States and never getting an interview. And finally, just through a personal connection, he managed to get an interview and was hired for a job two, la two levels above what he interviewed for. And so he's working in quality assurance now in, in computers and has started his own company where he trains uh, refugees and displaced people to do quality assurance and then he vouches for their skills and connects them with companies and so he's already sort of you know giving back so they're doing really well and it's been i mean happily with them being in the us they're really the only people in the film or uh, so much of our crew is outside of the us but they've been able to come and and uh, travel with us as we've shared the film theatrically so that's been a real gift <laughs>